into our panel discussions. Uh, we have some absolutely phenomenal individuals with a wealth of knowledge that would be engaging us in this panel discussion. Uh, the first of them is a seasoned human resource practitioner with 17 years of experience in people leadership and development. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Ghana, a Master of Business Administration a degree in human resource management from the University of Wales in the United Kingdom, and he's a chartered member of the CIPD. He's a strong advocate for equity, gender, and inclusive workplace practices, and he's passionate about the future of work, and is currently steering agile and business transformation programs in Unilever across West Africa as enablers for business growth. Permit me, ladies and gentlemen, to invite Mr. Michael Ochiri Diaw with a round of applause. Thank you very much for joining us on the days. Thank you. Our next panel member uh, is the Chief HR Officer for arguably the biggest media conglomerate in Ghana, the Multimedia Group. He's a seasoned human resource professional with 26 plus years of vast experience in HR and other leadership roles. He has varied and proving experiences in HR and spanning across a lot of industries, from media, banking, shipping, PR, and advertising. He's an HR change maker, a council member of the Ghana Employers Association, a member of the board of directors of Elohim Books and Stationery Limited, Accra, and a reverend minister at Victory Bible Church. Permit me, with another resounding round of applause, to invite up here Nana Mbro Elegba. So the final member of our panel is an award-winning C-suit human resource executive. She's a product of the University of Cape Coast, where she obtained a Bachelor of Arts honors degree and a diploma in education concurrently. That's amazing. She also has a master's degree in business administration, specializing in human resource management from the University of Ghana Business School, and holds a doctorate degree in business administration from the Swiss International Business School. In 2018, uh, she joined the Volta River Authority as the Director of Human Resources. She was responsible for the provision of end-to-end -end HR services and support for all the companies in the group. She's currently an advisor to the Office of the Chief Executive. With a round of applause, shall we invite Dr. Mrs. Irene Stella Ajinimboatin. So ladies and gentlemen, th these sessions will be very interactive. Um, it means we would all play a key part, uh, not just in imparting knowledge, uh, but in soaking in the knowledge and bouncing it across the room. Thank you very much uh, to my panelists. Welcome. Uh, you're all looking absolutely elegant. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be on the seat. Uh, I'm sure uh, we all look forward to what the world will be, um, especially when human resource uh, it's the dominant force that leads everything that we do. Uh, it, I think it does already, doesn't it? Uh, and inching towards a world where we're looking at a lot of innovation uh, based on the trends and all of that, and we're all looking for improvement. We are looking for all the cutting edge strategies that would ensure that we adapt. So adaptability will be the key word through a lot of the conversations that we would have. Now, a lot of us would agree that living in the world that we live in now, where uh, we are facing some sort of economic crisis with um, world economic growth projected to be just 2% in the next year, as opposed to the expected 6%, uh, it shows you that there's a little bit of retrogression on the economic side of things, uh, as well as all the other factors, including the Russia-Ukraine war and all the currency slumps across the world. These things don't just affect individuals, they affect industries, they affect organizations as well. Today we are going to bisect and dissect the role of HR in the future of work in terms of this adaptation, especially during an economic crisis. Now, a lot of people would define an economic crisis in a lot of different ways. Uh, starting off with our first panelist, um, Stella, uh, looking at the kind of world we live in, um, how best uh, would you 
um, put forth what an economic crisis really is in relation to the world of work. So thank you very much and uh, good morning audience. Um, I think that you've just put it right and as a keynote speaker you know, addressed us, we are in a VUCA world. We are in times where there is so much unpredictability and there's so much ambiguity around everything that we are doing. We are talking about economic crisis that is a global situation and we are looking at HR at the center of businesses that are either local or global. And we are looking at HR people who are supposed to surmount all these challenges and carry people along. And so in, in terms of business, there are two things that we need to look at. We need to look at the people who really are a, a story that we will always tell. We need to look at our businesses you know, to ensure that even in times where there is economic crisis, our businesses are still thriving and our people are still going along. How would we do, it, do this? As HR people, I think that fundamentally, we ourselves have a, a serious role to play. The point is that we cannot give what we don't have. And so we need to strengthen our HR capabilities. We need to understand the economic situation we need to understand globalization and how it impacts on our local and individual organizations as well as our individual employees. We need to look at our business practices and our business strategies. We need to look at how our decision making is done. We need to look at how we strengthen ourselves to be able to give back to that, you know, in that situation. Employees today looking at the economic crisis obviously will be looking at you know, their purchasing power. People will be looking at what I'm giving in terms of my skills and what I'm getting back. Is it something that is, you know, commensurate with what I think I have given? At the same time as an HR person, whilst we are looking at that and ensuring that the economies in terms of, you know, the financial that we give to our employees are in the best state to keep them going and to keep them coming and giving of their best to the organization, I think we are also in a very... Um, difficult situation, as it were, when we have to also look at our businesses and see whether whatever we are asking for, whatever we are doing, whatever we are giving back, will really commit the organization to have a long-term journey, to be a going concern. I think that dichotomy is something that as HR personnel, we need to find our feet very well play our role very well, look at efficiencies. We've talked about digitalization. We're talking about HR analytics. I'm sure that we may be going in there. But these are things that we have to start equipping ourselves with so that whilst we are looking you know, to the employees and making sure that we are engaging them, getting the best out of them, squeezing everything out of them, squeezing everything out of the business as well, but still making sure that we have a business that is thriving, people who are happy, and then we can have a job and be able to move, you know, a, a, a situation in such economic, you know, challenges that is affecting everyone globally. Fantastic. Uh, remember, this is very interactive, so you can pen your questions down. We definitely will take them. Now, talking about dichotomies, um, Nana, uh, when you look at the practice of HR, I mean, you're looking at the likes of human capital development, you're looking at the likes of staff welfare, remuneration, etc. I mean, for all of these components, uh, they play a very key role in the entire HR function. Um, is it a case uh, that they would all be affected uh, by virtue of the fact that we are in a crisis that seeps through everything, or uh, we can find a balance somewhere? Can you re repeat that? Because is it a case that... Is it a case uh, that for each of the components of HR, from remuneration to human capital development uh, to staff welfare, etc., um, are they all liable to being affected by the kind of crisis we find ourselves in, or uh, we can find a balance somewhere and try to prioritize for others over the, the rest? Well, I think your question, the, the answer lies in the question. Um, like everyone else has said, like our keynote speaker, Dr. Donko, like um, Dr. Ajenim Boating has also said, we are in times that are not normal. And so it cannot be business as usual. Something has definitely got to give. And so from an HR perspective, how do you get a careful balance? It's all about engagement. If you look at the economic crisis that we have on our hands, I mean, as businesses, we all go into planning sessions. We plan ahead of the year. I'm sure that if you cast your minds back 
and you look at all the assumptions, the economic assumptions that undergirded your planning, you can see that everything has gone out the window. If you take inflation, for example, what projections did you have in mind? If you take the fuel prices, if you take the exchange rate, and so on and so forth. And so on the back of all these assumptions, I'm sure all of us had some plans as far as welfare for our team members is concerned, our employees. We had plans relating to uh, remuneration. We had plans relating to people development, development of our human capital, and so on and so forth. Of course, all premised on the back of some anticipated profits. And I'm sure that if I were to go around the room, most of us have had our revenues and our profits not coming through as expected. And so if your revenues and your profits are not coming through as expected, like Dr. Ajeni Mbwating said, you cannot give what you do not have. So what do you do? Engagement, engagement, engagement. You need to engage your people constantly, either in one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, um, staff debates or town halls, whatever means, try and engage them bring them along, let them understand the difficulties, okay, the economic difficulties that are staring all of us in the face. And these are realities, harsh realities of our times. Let them understand that when the times are good, when the times, um, the, 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 the situation improves and becomes better, then all of us will have a stake. So in times like this, what you need to stress on is to make sure that you are using your resources in the best possible manner efficiency um, if, if a car does not have to move, because a car does not run on water, it runs on fuel, there's maintenance, a driver, and so on and so forth. If you do not have to leave the office, if someone, um, and every little cost shall count, okay? If you see that a colleague is in the habit of leaving the air conditioning on when he or she is not in the office, you need to call people out like that. So there should be accountability increase accountability. All of us need to be accountable to make sure that we rein our costs in across the board. The mantra should be that no law should hit us, which can be um, avoided through constant care. Constant care should be the watchword. Constant care. You make sure that there's a renewed sense of responsibility. You bring your employees along. All of them become ambassadors of improved efficiency so that we can safeguard the golden um, goose uh, that lays the eggs. If not, by the end of the crisis, if we want to continue business as usual, to say that, yes, our employees deserve an increase. On the back of their performance over the last year, yes, they may deserve an increase, but we cannot give what we do not have. So let's be mindful of that fact, and let's make sure that we engage them, let them understand, take them through the journey, what their assumptions were at the beginning of the year, where we are now, and why it is just not possible. Okay, and, and, and let them understand that once they continue on the trajectory as far as performance is concerned and the times improve, then we can all sit down and, and begin to um, enjoy um, from the fruits of our labor. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Nana El Legba. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ochu, Dia. So it's Ochu Dia. Dia. Dia, Mr. Dia. Okay, Mr. Dia, um, Nanai Legba hammered very much on engagement, and we all agree that in the workplace, there's always a stratification. There's uh, different people at different levels with different expectations, etc. Uh, what strategies do you feel uh, would work most in order to ensure uh, that this engagement uh, is not just passive, uh, but actually has an effect on our workforce? Thank you, and good morning. Uh, thank you. It's a beautiful event, and uh, I, I, it, it's, I also find it as a festival of ideas. So whilst our audience will be listening to the panelists, I believe we can also get some um, ideas from the audience as well. So talking about strategy and building on Nana's point on engagement, um, reflecting on the uh, the keynote address from Dr. Donko. I think this is the moment that we have to bring humane HR to bear. And what I call humane HR is how do we put ourselves in the shoes of employees? There's a lot going on in the world today. Uh, it's a multi-generation workforce that we have. 
you've got those uh, who you, you call your baby boomers, you've got your millennials, you've got your generation Y and Z. So one size strategy won't fit all. You've got to really understand your workforce. But I think the key word for me in engagement is being humane and really understanding the workforce, what their, their unique needs are and how you engage with them. Uh, when we talk engagement, it's somewhat a big word. And for me, when we talk about engagement or employee engagement, it's more like the pulse of the organization. What are the perceptions people have? What are the unique needs that they have? And understanding these and addressing them in that unique context. Okay, so there are several approaches you can adopt in engaging with employees. But what is important for me in all of this is really understanding the unique context of each of the workforce or the people that you're dealing with. Uh, we spoke about VUCA. All these are overwhelming the workforce. They are pressures from home, pressures and demands from the office. There's also um, the demands of the employer to ensure that we deliver shareholder value. So how do you create enablers, or how do you create that platform that the employee is able to thrive? And being able to understand the enablers, creating that platform for employee to thrive, for me would underpin that engagement strategy. So understand your workforce, understand their unique needs, and ask yourself, what are the enablers that I put in place that would enable them to thrive? That would be at the best version of themselves at their workplace. That basically would be my approach in uh, building our employee engagement. Definitely. Thank you very much. Um, like I said, it's a very interactive session. Uh, I believe there are a lot of gems in the audience as well. Uh, so my wonderful people who have microphones around you can definitely um, contribute to this all-important conversation. Now, Doc, uh, coming back to you. Uh, he spoke about um, the humane side of HR. I mean, considering how volatile and unpredictable we find ourselves, the time we find ourselves in, um, it's very essential to be very measured in our approach. But then again, sometimes uh, we might not find the right balance when it comes to being measured. We might be overly humane, or we'll probably be underwhelmingly humane. I mean, wh where do we get this balance from? I mean, how do we get balance that actually works? Is it through the analytics? Is it through en uh, engagement once again? Is, is it through a very intensive interactions? How do we make it work? <laughs> I think you, you are very right. You see, when it comes to um, the balancing act, there is never a, the best way, you know, to have it. You always need to study the system, you need to understand your situation, you need to understand the parameters around which you are working, and then be able to provide the right solution that is tailor-made for the situation at hand. So definitely in, situ in, in times like this, in the VUCA times, we obviously need to be very humane as HR people. And there was one time that a, a former CEO that I worked with uh, we were having a discussion. He had moved on, you know, to another country, and then we were talking about, you know, HR issues. And there is a profound statement that he made that has still resonated with me. Um, he was trying to describe the HR person in that country that, you know, he was now working with, and he said, "Well, she's doing well, but she's actually an HR without an H." And I asked, "What does that mean?" And he said, yes, he's an HR person, but he's not human. And this is what a CEO thought of an HR person. So as HR people, the H there is not for nothing that we have human, you know, signifying a kind of profession. We have always been talking about working from home. And I think that it's become a bad thing. But let's also understand that for as long as it works for other people, and it is really an opportunity for people to have flexi way of, you know, working, taking care of their families, especially maybe young mothers, uh, young fathers, etc. There are also, I mean, if you're an HR person who would want to think that that is just the only way to handle your staff, you may be getting it wrong. Because there are also some employees 
who are undergoing some emotional and psychological trauma. Just, you know, living in an environment for 24 hours that they, they, they just cannot do much. They cannot even connect with people. They cannot connect with friends. Some of them have some kind of domestic challenges that really, you know, to say that for the rest of your career or for as long as, let's say, COVID or the new, you know, uh, um, world order is, you are assigned to working from home. You may think that you are doing this person a favor trying to help the situation. You may actually be pressing him or her, you know, towards a certain situation that you are not aware of. And so I think that the issue about balancing is understanding the various dynamics in your organization, understanding the culture where you operate, understanding the kind of business that you are in to make sure that whilst you are doing this, you are not doing it to the detriment of other people who may be just the exceptions, you know, to the rule. Again, we also need to understand that creating that kind of balance is also not being overly emotional about issues, such that where right decisions have to be taken, you allow your emotional judgment you know, to take a better part of that you know, end result. You need to understand the issues at stake. And I think all of us have talked about engagement, engagement, engagement. We've also talked about issues around cost-cutting, you know, so sometimes the decision must be difficult, but it must be hard. Sometimes the conversation may not be so comfort comfortable, but it must be hard. So that if we need to play it well and apportion, you know, a, a, a cost in a way that brings efficiency to the business, we will have to do that. That may not, that is not being inhuman, but that is trying to be very practical and making sure that you are creating a balance between your human part, dealing with the people, making sure that you understand them, making sure that their issues are addressed as quickly, and the issue of communication being at the forefront, opening up to the people, letting them understand what the business is going through, and at the same time, taking the right decisions, making sure that if somebody is working from home, you have ways of monitoring, you have ways of ensuring that results are coming in, and it is not a holiday, it is not an extension of vacation, making sure that people are up to the task, making sure that you've provided the right tools and demanding the right results. So making those demands, it's not inhuman, but making sure that the business is also thriving. Because at the end of the day, in all fairness, without the people, there is no business. At the same time, without business, you and I have no jobs. And if we have no jobs, how do we take care of our families? How do we take care of ourselves? And so playing it as just being totally, in quote, human, without recourse to right decisions, without recourse to you know, right uh, business and professional uh, discussions, we may be getting the balancing wrong. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mrs. <laughs> Dr. Mrs. Selajin Sel Sel in uh, I'm, I'm excited to have people from diverse industries. So we have public sector, uh, we have media, uh, we have FMCG, if I'm right, for Unilever. Uh, so it means we are going to get a lot of very practical insights. Now, uh, now uh, Dr. Made, uh, Mr. Dia, uh, Dr. made a very important point and it bordered around performance management and culture. I mean, in times like these, a lot of organizations uh, are either going to uh, amend their performance management processes uh, or perhaps uh, stick to it to the detriment of uh, their staff in terms of engagement, as well as that, uh, when it comes to culture, uh, they are either going to have to amend their culture or not. So when it comes to these amendments, um, how do organizations deal with their amendments? Do they um, just go on with business as usual, or they have to amend cultures and uh, performance uh, management processes that have uh, been along for a very, very long time? All right, thanks. Uh, let me start with culture, and culture basically is um, how we do things. T today, when you look at um, the employee or the talent out there, what do they want from a culture point of view? Um, and, and listening to Dr. Donko and um, the content in his uh, keynote address, you'd realize the balance of power, or let me say the, the pendulum of power is balanced, okay? And the em employees are demanding a lot more from employers today. And 
it, it cannot be business as usual. So when we talk about culture, for me, the first one would be values. And when you look at the young generation, values mean a lot to them. So an organization that is not seizing the opportunity to dial up their values, values in terms of respect, in terms of dignity, transparency in your business operations, you will not be attractive to the young generation. This is a generation that wants to challenge the status quo. This is a generation that will not just accept anything the boss says. They are, they are ready to put their jobs on the line, put their livelihood on the line, and get their voices heard, get their voices at the table. So it's very important that we realize that how we do things, how we work, has got to be balanced. So you've got your organization's reputation to protect, but at the same time, we've also got to create the right culture, the right ambience that would attract the sort of talent that you want in your organization. Uh, well-being, purpose, flexibility, these are things that mean a lot to the, to, to the young generation. And these are also people you did in the organization. And I think uh, Dr. Duncan made a point around the multi-generation we have. Um, for those of us, and let me put myself in the older, older generation, we tend to think we understand them. But I also feel there's some sort of generational arrogance in there. So whilst we feel we understand them, when we feel this is how it has to go, we've got the experience we want to direct, they also feel they are the best because they've brought the internet, they have brought all the technology that is driving the world of work today. Okay, so when you are creating a culture in the organization, you've got to think about all these. How does flexibility come into play? We're talking about work from home, hybrid working. It means a lot to them. They feel I'm more productive when I work from home, whilst your head of HR or your MD feels being in the office where I have eight to five visibility on what you do is what makes you productive or I get more value from you. But that is not how the young generation sees it. And that is the future of work. So how do you ensure you've got the right balance in your culture? Okay, and, and, and for me it's all about the enablers. The enablers that would give them that flexibility they're asking for that would give them the well-being they want to protect. That would give them, in terms of the things that they want at the workplace, but at the same time, being able to deliver value uh, to the organization. So for me, that is uh, on culture. Now, when we talk of performance management, that also has to change. And again, the key word for me in here would be accountability. What is the level of accountability? There is also a generation that wants responsibility. They want to be given the empowerment. They want to be given the mandate to run things. But we've got to help them understand that responsibility comes with accountability. And that would underpin performance management. So while I'm giving you the responsibility, I'm empowering you, you run the show. In the end, you've got to be accountable to results. And once we're able to define this, once we're able to support them to understand these enablers, we would be good. But obviously, it's not going to be um, business as usual because it's a very um, VUCA environment at the moment and very dynamic day in, day out. You've really got to assess the situation and understand what works best for your employees and at the same time, what works best for the employer. Because as um, Doc mentioned, at the end of the day, shareholder value must be delivered. That is critical. Other than that, there's no business and, and, and there's no employee as well. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dua. A round of applause. Uh, talking about dynamism, Nana, you work in a very dynamic <laughs> sector, the media sector. It's not just very dynamic. Uh, but then the human resource issues in the human sector are, are a case study on their own, especially when it, when it comes to times like these, where people just fly around when, when they can. Uh, it's a very competitive industry, et cetera. I mean, in times like these, I mean, how do you deal with that dynamism and, and, and that attrition? Ah, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, like you rightly stated, um, 
the kind of, of um, talents that we are dealing with in the media space is like no other space. Um, I have worked across industries, so I can, I can appreciate that. In the industry that I work, people have a sense of entitlement that you would not find anywhere. People think that they are entitled to a house, they are entitled to a car. When their rent runs out, they come telling you that I need to pay my rent, give me money. I mean, all kinds of demands. And what makes it increasingly difficult is that in our space, mostly in, in, within the media industry, you either have um, companies that focus only on English-speaking brands, you have companies that focus on the Akan-speaking brands. In my company, we have a combination of both. So there's what I call a clash of cultures. You have those who have the, um, you know, the Akan-speaking background, and then you have the English brands who have the corporate kind of mentality. And so dealing with, with, with situations like that is, 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 is a real challenge. Now, how do we ensure that we have a fine balancing act? How do we ensure that we retain them? It is by recognizing that everyone has different needs. You don't treat all of them the same. You don't use the same paintbrush for all of them. And so, like I said, it's about engaging them, getting to know what motivates them individually, okay? Obviously, we are not a Father Christmas, so we cannot meet everyone at their point of need. But the most important thing is that you engage them, you know what motivates them, you know what drives them, you know what makes them get out of bed every day. So for some people, they have to be on air at 5 a.m. every single day. I mean, how many of us will be able to do that consistently for years? So something has got to drive the person. And so for such a person, what does a person need? Is it more money in the pocket? Is it a house? Is it a car? And so that calls on our creativity. It calls for coming up with retention strategies. Okay, that will be able to, because if you are not able to retain your best talents, uh, people make an appointment with these talents. So you got to, to be able to retain them. So we have a mix. It's not a one size or one hat fits all kind of strategy. So a mix, so for, so for some people, we have entered into all kinds of arrangements with some vendors, some butter arrangements and all of that. So depending on what they need, we direct them, we, we've signed on to uh, all kinds of, we, we, and we make use of our resources. Our resource is the airwaves, okay? So that is what we use. So people come onto our airwaves to advertise, and then we use that. Butter is quite prevalent within the kind of industry that um, I operate in. It may not apply uh, to most of you. But if you have to retain your talents, use the resource that is available to you. You may not be able to meet everyone 100%, but let them understand, okay? For some people, it is training and development opportunities. So give them those. For some people, it is their health and, and well-being. That is what matters to them. And so one of the things that we have done, because of the pressure on people to deliver, people are on air, we operate in an environment, what I'll call just like the medical profession. It's a live environment, 24-7, so there's a lot of pressure. So we have made the services of a professional therapist available, and when people are stressed out, we are in times where there's a unique emphasis on mental health like no other. And so we've made the services of these professionals available, and as and when team members feel that there's a need to talk to a professional, to ease the stress and pressure on them, they go do that. Okay, this is in spite of, of the medical insurance we have in place. So we've gone beyond the normal medical insurance to make some of these um, services and facilities available to team members. And uh, we've been able to strike arrangements with some vehicle vendors. And so for our top talents, we make sure that they have vehicles. Uh, for some top talents, we make sure that we have um, housing facilities for them. We've entered into some arrangements, uh, of course, on, on, on butter terms with some vendors. And a number of them, I mean, I may not be able to emulate all of them, but these are some of the ones that come to mind. So we engage them, make sure that we are aware of what motivates people. We look at what their unique needs are, and within the constraints of our resources, we try to meet people 
at their point of need. So that, that is how we do it in a nutshell. I don't yeah. know if that satisfies. Yeah, it does. I mean, for a lot of people. For a lot of people, they've been wondering how you've been doing it. I mean, because uh, we, we all know what's happening in the media space. You tune in and you hear somebody on Peace FM today and tomorrow they're on Adom FM and vice versa. Uh, so at this juncture, uh, I'll involve all of you. Uh, I'll take questions or contributions. There uh, are people walking around with microphones on both sides of the room. If you do uh, want to ask us a question or you want to uh, contribute based on the very interesting uh, topics that we have put on the board, please just uh, raise your hand. They would walk up to you. So please, yeah, thank you. So just introduce yourself, uh, your organization, and take it from there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, moderator. My name is Stephen Baffo. I work for the Kofi Annan ICT Center, not the Peacekeeping Training Center, the ICT Center of Excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A round of applause for him, ladies and gentlemen. Listening to the keynote speaker and the panelists, I find that the HR person must be very adaptable in terms of their changes. And when you look at the changes against VUCA, it means the HR person must be very adaptable. My concern, however, is the conversation has centered mostly around people who are already in the organization. But before they come to you, they would have gone to a university. They would have gone to a training institution somewhere. They would have been prepared from somewhere before they come to you to work for your organization. Given what we are learning this morning, how must the conversation be in terms of engaging with our training institutions and making sure that they use their training to prepare the, the, uh, the talents that you require? What engagement must the HR profession have with our training institutions so that one of the panelist members said that uh, resources have become quite scarce and so we are cutting budgets. And that's what I like to do a lot of the time as finance director, look at it and say you can't have this. But you need to train people. And so if the training that they are getting from the universities and the other training institutions is that low, it means you can't cut on your talent retooling and retraining budget. What must the conversation be with respect to training? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, who's, who's taking that? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I uh, wanted to address you by your name, but uh, Ma Stephen. Thanks, thanks for your question, Stephen. And uh, I want to share with you what we do in Unilever. So we have warehoused that under what we call youth employability. And so it's basically to address the concern you highlighted. But the return of the investment for us as an employer is also we build a pipeline of talent. And as and when we have vacancies, we know where to go and get the talent. So. We're working with academia. We have partnership with um, the University of Ghana. We have partnership with Ashesi. We have partnership with KNUST, UCC, and a couple of other universities. And talking about youth employability, it's how do you create an out-of-classroom learning experience or platform for, for students who are learning, for them also to experience the corporate world experience what goes on at the workplace, then that prepares them uh, for the future of work or it gets them ready even before they graduate. It also helps them to triangulate what they're studying in school and how that uh, translates in practice. So internship is one of uh, our youth employability programs and I think Dr. Donko alluded to that, that we give internship opportunities to the students. It's not a favor. It is an opportunity to develop the future workforce of this country. And as I mentioned, it's also to build a talent pipeline for us. We also run um, a program we call Idea Trophy. So we come up with a business challenge. And I think there are a couple of corporate programs similar to that, but Unilever 
we have labeled ours idea trophy where we come up with a business challenge and this is these are real business challenges so if we have a problem with any of our brands either omo kiso or geisha we throw it out to students and you'll be amazed at the number of creative and innovative ideas these students come up with even though they don't have the corporate experience so that also gives them the opportunity to practice um, in terms of their business acumen the commercial acumen and getting them ready and then we also uh, have a mentoring program where we organize for our senior managers go out their campuses we get students and um, we, 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 we do mentoring in that mentoring session, there's also what we call the reverse mentoring. So it's not just top down, but the reverse mentoring then becomes um, bottom up as well, where you learn from the younger generation in terms of how savvy they are with technology, data analytics. We were just told we should all sign up to the Instagrams and the Snapchats and all that. And you learn from, from them. Very interesting idea. So reverse mentoring is, I mean, very value adding that we also get from the youth employability programs we run. We've got a number of students on campus, we call them brand ambassadors, that advocate some of our Unilever programs on campus. And then the overarching one of all these is our graduate training program, um, which also then gives students opportunities to join our organization. So I thought just to share with you how we're connecting with academia and students, creating that learning and development platform for them whilst they are in school, even before they graduate. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would like to add to um, what my colleague panelists has said. I'm thinking that beyond individual organizations and the efforts that we make to give internship opportunities to um, students and um, beyond what all of us are doing within our own spaces. There should be a concerted national effort. It looks to me that the HR professional umbrella bodies are a bit fragmented. So I would recommend if all the different HR bodies can come together and can lobby the government Okay, that if organizations were to create internship opportunities for students, there can be some tax um, credits or whatever. Then the HR bodies, professional bodies, will then be talking to the universities, okay, and will be agreeing on some program, some minimum standards that we would like to see all graduating students go through internship opportunities. Let's face it, I don't know, now I think there's a bit of improvement because I cast my mind back to way back when we were in the university. None of us ever had the opportunity. I recall that it was when I was doing um, a graduate uh, program at the School of Communication Studies. So for undergrad, I never went through that. I didn't know what to expect as far as the world was concerned. Now fast forward, I go to School of Communication Studies and I get the opportunity to do an internship at Unilever, your place way back then, I had absolutely no idea what to expect. So I went first day, I called a friend of mine, I said today will be my first day of work, so since it's the first day, I'm sure that I'll have time on my hands. So at 11 a.m., let's meet. I went in, and to my shock and my surprise, as soon as I entered, I mean, from 8 a.m., I was given a pile, you know? I had to work at a time on a, on a magazine, it was given to me to run fully, and I was given timelines, and it was such a shock to my system. And I'm sure that there are a lot of our, our graduates coming out of the universities not knowing what to expect because nothing has prepared them for, for the practical world of work. So it is incumbent on all of us as HR professionals, as HR umbrella bodies, professional HR bodies, to liaise with academia and tell them that for your students, it is important that all of them, it must become a mandatory thing, that all of them must go through. And for uh, going through, we must be able to spell out what we expect to see, okay? So when anyone goes to do an internship, at the end of it, what must we see? There must be some forms. It must be formalized. Um, forms must be completed, okay, to indicate what the expectations were, if the expectations have been met. And if companies are incentivized enough 
to open up opportunities for people to do it by way of some tax uh, rebates, I'm sure that we will be able to crack uh, this this uh, problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. By the way, sorry to add to that. Thank you. Yeah, just I mean because this is um, quite a topical um, question and discussion, so I just want to add a bit to it. Um, so you realize that education or training, as we put it, it is from you know cradle to grave. I mean, you cannot you cannot decide that you are not training people and still expect that they will give you results that you want. And so training, I think, when it comes to you know, discussion or collaboration between industry and academia, it is a discussion that really needs to go on to establish that strong relationship as we have all you know, agreed. It may be done on the individual organization level based on what your needs are, but it should be also done from the professional level. So in some organizations, you know, you have the opportunity to get into even taking part or you know, impacting the curriculum development of some of these institutions based on what you think you know, industry may need. And when that happens, I think one, one key thing that I want to leave here is the fact that most of us are professionals. We are in our industries, we are blossoming. But we need to go back and even take up some adjunct teaching opportunities there. Not pro bono, just making sure that you are preparing people who will come back into your industry and not give you so much challenge. However, no matter how much you would have given to them before they join you, sometimes there, it, is, it is not just what you study in school that really makes you who you will be at the workplace. And so there are some soft skills that we may not necessarily teach or they are not teaching. But when you come to the workplace, issues around communication, you know, in the, in the corporate, or issues around attitude, issues about, you know, uh, interpersonal relationship, issues about your personal gravitas that you build, issues about confidence, etc. These are things that as HR people, we need to have strategies to actually implore them when people come to work with us. If you take VRA, um, which is where I work, um, VRA has that kind of collaboration because we are typically an engineering institution. However, we have other subsidiaries that cut across different industries. And so you are recruiting for engineers, you are recruiting for doctors, you are recruiting for nurses, you are recruiting for hotel, you know, hospitality experts, you are recruiting for uh, agric, you are recruiting for all, you know, we have all the schools. You are recruiting for teachers. And so we, we actually have this kind of discussions. And then sometimes some of us get into the classroom to actually, you know, up, up, before you are presenting in your organization, you are teaching. And again, we have the management training program, as you know, has been said. So currently, as I even speak with you, a current, you know, crop of management trainees are in our academy because we actually run an academy that, you know, brings uh, um, academia and industry. And so these young ones are there, and you are taking them through a whole year's program, formalized program, of trying to inculcate the values and corporate culture and the way of doing things and bringing what they know, bridging that to their, to their corporate world, and they are there. We also have situations where we actually sponsor some of the, of the you know, scholarships for some institutions so that they can train the people to fit the purpose for which you want them. Currently, we have a kind of collaboration with KNUST, for instance, the College of Engineering, where you know, we want to even take opportunity to, to be research chairs, to have research chair opportunities in the university. What it will do is that you are able to give some kind of you know, amount of money which can actually deepen research opportunities for students who are there, for lecturers who are teaching them, and for your employees who also need to understand the details of what is happening today in the, in the, you know, in the corporate world or in the industry that they are working in. And so I think that for us as HR people, we need to have an end-to-end -end kind of program and strategy that will really take them on board whilst they are in school, continue to train them whilst they are at work, and even 
get in touch with all these institutions and other educational you know, uh, bodies to be able to influence as much as we can the curriculum and its development. Because they have a different, you know, the academia has a different mandate. We have a different mandate. And so we understand each other and try to bridge that gap and have that collaboration. You might not necessarily say that, you know, um, they are not churning out what you want and they tell you, well, that is our mandate. We churn them out, do what you want to do with them. You have no choice but to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stella Ajinim Boateng. Thank you very much. So at this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say thank you to my panelists. Uh, it's been amazing. We had Dr. Ajinim Boateng, a round of applause for her. Phenomenal. We had Mr. Elegba from Multimedia. And we had Mr. Gia from Unilever. A round of applause. Thank you very much. I'm sure you all have a lot of questions as well. Please pen them down. We'll have an opportunity to put them across. So we'd like to say thank you to them for joining us. Thank you to you as well. Thank you. Awesome.